Picture this. The year is 1929, it's a crisp Easter Sunday, and we find ourselves in the heart of the annual Easter Sunday parade in New York City. The hot topic in the crowd isn't the parade itself or the glorious spring weather. Oh no, it's something far more scandalous. The notion that women smoke cigarettes. That sounds pretty absurd, doesn't it? But in the 1920s, women smoking was quite the taboo, as cigarettes were seen as accessories of corrupted women, prostitutes, and social outcasts. This taboo was thought to be so offensive at the time that several US states even tried to outlaw women smoking. But then a plot twist right out of a Hollywood movie unfolded mid-parade. A group of fashionable debutantes emerges from the crowd, struts into the parade, and what do they do? They light up cigarettes right there in front of God and everybody else. And with a defiant smirk, they branded these cigarettes as torches of freedom. But here's the punchline. There was no real protest, and there was no heartfelt rebellion. I mean, to everyone watching there, there certainly was. And the newspapers had this all over the front page the very next day. But what nobody, except a handful of people knew, was this was a theatrical spectacle orchestrated by one man to serve his client's demands. And that client was none other than Big Tobacco, specifically Lucky Strike. This wasn't a protest at all. It was propaganda. And who was the master of deception that orchestrated it? Well, his name was Edward Bernays, the man who, as you will learn today, is responsible for modern-day consumerism. A man who is very likely the most influential person you've never heard of. This is the story of how a young immigrant working in advertising went on to manipulate millions of people into spending money on things they didn't want, and in doing so, inventing the field of public relations and shaping the world around you in ways you can't even imagine. Our story begins in Toledo, Ohio. The year is 1917. The lights are dim as the velvet curtain of the Grand Opera House opens. A spellbinding voice echoes across the hall, and it belongs to Enrico Caruso, an Italian opera star being guided to international fame by his cunning agent. This agent is an Austro-Hungarian immigrant named Edward Bernays, a man whose lineage would pique the curiosity of anyone interested in human psychology. And that's because Bernays' uncle was none other than Sigmund Freud, the father of psychoanalysis. And now Bernays was making a star out of Enrico Caruso by generating interest in his mysteriously beautiful voice by publicly having the singer go to comedic lengths just to protect it. But on this night, April 2nd, 1917, it was his life that was about to take a turn that no one saw coming. A world-defining announcement was being made at the exact same time, 300 miles away in Washington, D.C., as President Woodrow Wilson was declaring the U.S. was about to join World War I and fight against Austria and Germany. War propaganda was about to become the talk of the town, and Bernays, with his unique set of skills, found himself, like several other propagandists at the time, summoned by the U.S. government. Bernays joined the Committee of Public Information, tasked with selling America's war motives to the public at home and abroad. President Woodrow Wilson wanted to make clear that his agenda was not to establish the old European empires, but rather export democracy to Europe. Throughout the war, President Wilson found Bernays' execution and ideas so impressive that the president invited the then 26-year-old Bernays to join him at the Paris Peace Conference after the war. The reception Wilson received in Paris was shocking to even Bernays. Swarms of people rushed the streets to get a glimpse of their hero, the great liberator, President Woodrow Wilson. As a young Bernays watched on, stunned by the sheer impact of his work, he began to wonder, if these techniques could work a magic during times of war, could they perhaps be harnessed in times of peace? There was just 
one little detail that was killing our anti-heroes daydream. The word propaganda. It was tainted in America. It carried a negative undertone and was associated with German war efforts. But our clever Bernays wasn't gonna let semantics ruin his grand plans. All he needed was a new term. And thus, public relations was born. After the war, Edward Bernays returned to New York City. The war had changed Bernays. It had made him more confident in his abilities, but it had also reinforced the impression in his mind that people were dopes. And I'm not paraphrasing. Bernays often referred to people as stupid, dopes, sheep. So with a newfound sense of conviction, a devolved view of human intellect, and a shiny new phrase to describe what he did, he set up the first ever public relations consultancy and opened up his puppet mastermind for business. He wrote to his uncle Freud, gifting him a rare box of Havana cigars. Freud wrote back, returning the favor with a copy of his new book, Psychoanalysis. Bernays found the work captivating and felt that Freud's analysis of the human subconscious, human irrationality, and humans' need to desire was the key to manipulating the newly established big city crowds that were forming around a new era of American history. During this time, the American corporate landscape was undergoing quite the evolution of its own. The conclusion of the war marked the start of an era of rapid industrialization in America. With machines increasingly doing the heavy lifting, companies were now churning out goods faster than ever before. While this brought unprecedented efficiencies, it also created a fear amongst the leaders of corporate America, a fear of overproduction. Overproduction is an economic term that refers to a situation where supply exceeds the demand for goods and services. This can often lead to a fall in prices, dissolving profit margins, and producers may be left with unsold stock, which in dire situations can snowball into potentially causing economic downturns. Corporate America was petrified of this possibility, and an unsolvable riddle presented itself. How could they keep their factories buzzing, their workers busy, and the profits soaring if Americans only bought what they needed? And so the masters of American industry faced an urgent need to transform a society from a needs-based culture to a wants-based culture. In the words of investment banker Paul Mazur of Lehman Brothers, we must shift America. We must make Americans more conscious of style. People must be trained to desire, to want new things, even before the old have been entirely consumed. As the 20th century unfolded, a new social and economic order began to take shape, consumerism. Consumerism is the concept that promotes the virtue of acquiring goods and services in forever increasing volumes. It promotes the notion that an individual's well-being, happiness, and even social standing can be intrinsically linked to their capacity to consume. Consumerism advocates that consumer spending is the engine of economic growth. And while this seemingly new concept was about to take center stage in America, Early analysis of this concept can be traced all the way back to 1899, when the political economist, absolute critic of capitalism, and mustache of the century winner Theuschen Felblin theorized that conspicuous consumption became a means of signaling one's socioeconomic status, and that people owned and used products not just for their utility, but as emblems of prestige and affluence. In Veblen's book, The Theory of the Leisure Class, Veblen also establishes the economic phenomenon we know as Veblen goods. So America is going through this transformation, and as you already know by now, Edward Bernays is at the helm of it. But the reason it ended up being Bernays and not some other propagandist is because of the insights Bernays drew on from his uncle's work. Bernays understood something that set him apart from all the other marketers out there. Bernays understood that selling products wasn't about selling products. It was about selling emotions. At the time, 
Marketers thought that the most compelling way to communicate the virtues of a product were to list out all the things it could do. Bernays laughed at this and claimed that the utility of a product hardly motivated purchases at all. Bernays' approach is perhaps best articulated by a former employee of his, Peter Strauss, who said, Eddie Bernays saw that the way to sell a product was not to sell it to your intellect. You should buy this automobile, but rather, you would feel better if you had this automobile. He understood the idea that people were not just making purchases with their money, but instead engaging with the product with a piece of themselves. Bernays was the maestro of manufacturing desire, constructing emotional connections to purchases. But enough with the philosophy and the context. What did Bernays actually do? At this time in American history, one of the largest industries that feared overproduction was the newly thriving automobile industry. The mass production of cars had only just kicked off in the 1890s, a couple of decades before the war. So by 1924, even though cars were more sophisticated than ever, they had reached a saturation point in the market. Everyone who needed a car pretty much had one. So how were car companies supposed to sell more cars to a population that just didn't need them. The notion of one household owning more than one car was just ridiculous, and only something that the mega-rich would even entertain. Bernays was the first person to tell car companies to market cars not as utility, but as a symbol of male sexuality, giving rise to long-body luxury sedans and sports cars. Then, to take things a step further, Bernays advised his clients, General Motors, to create further demand for these new symbols of male vitality by going to market each year with new annual year designs. This was the origin of a practice later coined planned obsolence. At the time, Ford was easily the largest car manufacturer in the United States and had produced over half of all of the cars on the road. Henry Ford despised this practice of planned obsolence, and he felt that constantly going to market with new designs led to terrible engineering and was downright sleazy. His dream for the future of automobile markets was one with much more integrity, but consumers were hypnotized as their subconscious heartstrings were being yanked by Bernays' Freudian tricks. The virtues of engineering proved no match for Bernays' propaganda games as GM went on to outpace Ford sales over the next decade, claiming the spot it still holds today as America's largest automobile manufacturer. And what is perhaps even more significant is that the annual design upgrades are now synonymous with the automobile industry. But Bernays' influence didn't just stop at cigarettes and cars, he touched every facet of social life. He was the first to come up with the concept of product placement in film and television. He was the first to employ psychologists to write reports that specific products were good for people and then have the reports released and circulated in independent studies. The most famous example of this is showcased in his work with the Beechnut Packing Company, who hired Bernays to help sell more bacon. Bernays approached this challenge not by asking himself, how do Americans decide what to eat? But rather, who tells Americans what to eat? This gave Bernays the idea to approach his personal physician and ask him whether or not he would agree with the following argumentation. Because the body digests much of its calorie intake while sleeping, and because calories are the fuel people need to go about their days, people wake up from their sleep in a serious calorie deficit. And thus, having a larger breakfast as opposed to a lighter breakfast was a more optimal way for people to start their days. Now, today we know that that line of reasoning just isn't true. And to a pretty meaningful extent, the subconscious of Americans also knew this because no one was eating a large breakfast. Americans actually ate a very small breakfast, typically a piece of carbs paired with either juice or coffee. But Bernays' physician was willing to agree with this line of reasoning prompting Bernays to request him to write 5,000 other physicians in the country, polling them to ask if they too agreed with the sentiment. Of the 5,000 physicians they wrote, 4,500 of them wrote back saying that they agreed. Bernays then had these findings published and circulated in the press with headlines informing Americans that 
Thousands of physicians all agreed that a heavier breakfast was healthier than a lighter one, and that breakfast was the most important meal of the day. At the exact same time, Bernays planted other stories in the press that not so innocently promoted the virtues of eggs and bacon as the breakfast's finest protein-rich staples. No one batted an eye as the American breakfast, a brainchild of Bernays' propaganda, was popularized seemingly overnight. Bernays was also instrumental in sculpting modern fashion consumerism. Throughout the 1920s, all the major banks motivated by their agenda to evolve the ideology of the American shopper heavily invested in a brand new invention, the department store. This was going to be the porcelain jungle that homed all the overproduced shiny things Americans didn't need. But a new arena for consumption required a new breed of customers that America hadn't seen before. So the banks hired Bernays. Bernays then hosted a series of fashion shows in the stores that boasted an array of celebrities who also happened to be his clients. These celebrities would give speeches written by Bernays that prompted the idea that clothes were more than just fabric and thread. Each outfit was a ticket to express one's unique, magical, special characteristics. Without these clothes, how could one convey their inner charm and personality to the world? How could anyone be viewed as special if their clothes, the first thing that people saw when they looked at you, were just plain and ordinary? Now, while I certainly don't mean to imply Bernays should be credited with inventing branding, it is clear that the use of celebrity endorsements to communicate the uniqueness and desirability of certain clothing lines as opposed to others served as a catalyst for the role modern apparel brands hold today. But Bernays didn't just popularize fashion, he also directly influenced it. And not even for the clients you might expect. One day, Lucky Strike, the same cigarette brand that prompted Bernays to curate the Torches of Freedom propaganda, came to him with a rather perplexing problem. Through their focus groups, Lucky Strike had determined that women, who Bernays had now successfully transformed into a new class of smoking citizens, were choosing other cigarette boxes over theirs because Lucky Strike's green and red boxes were clashing with the fashion norms of the time. Bernays insisted that the solution here was obvious, change the packaging of the boxes to something more fashionable. The head of Lucky Strike insisted that there was no way that was going to happen as they had already invested millions of dollars into their branding and marketing efforts. They instead requested that Bernays make green a more fashionable color. And so that is exactly what he did. Bernays organized the Green Ball, a star-studded party generously covered by members of the press, which featured beautiful green artifacts and decorations placed strategically around the venue. He even had recognized intellectuals running around the room giving speeches about the historical virtues and poetic interpretations of the color green. Suddenly, giving a color that no one wanted to wear, quite the cachet. This was so successful that before the ball had even taken place, newspapers were feeding into the suspense, publicizing how green was becoming all the rage amongst members of high society in New York. Edward Bernays' work with the green ball is an unorthodox and striking embodiment of an economic concept referred to as market expansion theory. Bernays expanded the market for Lucky Strike by redefining social norms and fashion trends, thereby increasing demand for the green and red packaging. The economic implications of the market expansion theory lie in its potential for fostering new economic opportunities, industry growth, and increased consumer consumption, all of which can drive significant economic expansion and greater profiteering. So Bernays' clever plans were certainly doing their tricks. Americans were transformed into consumers, and corporate America couldn't be happier. Now their plans were simple, add fuel to the fire and expand into an even more innovative, more profitable, more American future. The corporations began borrowing, the banks began borrowing, and everyone's attitude was full steam ahead. Consumerism could do no wrong as it was powering one of the grandest stock market rallies of all time. And in case you needed one more Bernays jaw-dropper, 
This bull market was also partially credited to Bernays' doing, as he had used propaganda techniques to popularize retail investing. Up until this point in history, the average American took little to no interest in stocks. Why would they? The common man hardly knew a thing about them. And yet, Bernays was able to sway the masses into believing that, as Americans, investing was a self-fulfilling exercise of nationalism, and that owning a piece of the American economy was almost like a birthright, a no-brainer to any American who desired to live the American dream. This compelling message sent swarms of Americans rushing to buy stocks, predominantly from banks that, of course, Bernays represented and was working for the entire time. But as history will often remind us, you can only play God for so long, and Bernays was about to run into a daunting form of irrationality that even he could not comprehend. It was late October 1929. Bernays was organizing a massive event in the heart of New York City, which marked the 50th anniversary of the invention of the light bulb. The entire spectacle was paying homage to the innovations of American capitalism. In attendance were tens of thousands of Americans, as well as an endless number of notable figures that Bernays had in his pocket. Famous celebrities, the leaders of corporate America, business titans like John D. Rockefeller, and even the U.S. President, President Herbert Hoover. Everyone there at Bernays' request. Everyone there to glorify the gifts that consumerism had yielded. But as they were gathered, the chilling news was already beginning to spread. And so with it, panic. The U.S. stock market was completely collapsing. For years leading up to this, the overconfidence that came with consumerism and industrialization had led to a new wave of thinking. A mass delusion had misled the bankers, the businessmen, and it seemed even the politicians, as excess borrowing had been carried out under the notion that America was entering a new wave, one in which the glorious American economy was immune to economic downturns, recessions, and market crashes. This notion was absolutely ridiculous, and what pursued was the largest market crash in history. The Great Depression had just begun, washing away everything Bernays had built. As a quarter of America's workforce went on to lose their job, the spending spree came to a drastic halt. No longer were Americans compelled to purchase things that they didn't need, and it seemed like Bernays' time in the spotlight was finally over. But actually, it wasn't. It would turn out that Edward Bernays' influence, while hindered, wasn't down for the count. When the Great Depression ended, he managed to gain even more influence and power than ever before. But if you want to hear the rest of that incredible story, we'll be making a part two on the ultimate puppet master Edward Bernays once this video gets 15,000 likes. Picture this. We're in the deep south of America. The year is 1864. Confederate dollars are withering away into worthless nothingness, and the desperation of the southern states is starting to show on the faces of Confederate soldiers. A looming threat grows in the North. They know it's coming. The North has a leader who is about to make history. A leader with a vision, a cunning plan, and an economic arsenal of ingenuity that is about to change history forever as the survival of a nation hangs in the balance. 